Weinberg, and this is Book Circle Presents The Cavalry Cycle. We're continuing our reading of Captain Fletcher Gives the Talk, in which after two months of training, the captain begins interviewing his students to find out why they agreed to be transformed. Next, Sanders led in Wardley. Fletcher already knew all he needed to about Wardley. He would be easy. The most difficult part was his entry into Fletcher's office. Two months ago, when Fletcher had shot Wardley with the Sagitta, the fellow had been tall but skeletally thin and an oatmeal sort of color. He had wheezed all through his entrance interviews, refreshing himself constantly from an inhaler, but his eyes feverishly eager. The Sagitta had knocked him over like a felled tree. He had whooped and writhed and inflated and stood up changed. The office was built to cavalry spec, but still Wardley had ducked a little when coming in the door. By the time his hindquarters were well in, his forefeet were at Fletcher's desk, and he towered. Fletcher was seven feet tall. Wardley was easily eight. The largest cavalry t-shirt available strained across his chest. He saluted and did what he had been doing ever since the arrow struck, radiated simple happiness. Fletcher returned the salute. Have a seat. A minor seismic event followed. Fletcher reflected that no matter how well Wardley scored in agility training, he was unlikely to cook breakfast for the family when home on leave, unless he could do it by leaning through the kitchen window. Where, he wondered idly, did all that matter com come from? He was used to transformations now and rarely thought about the mechanics, but the sheer magnitude of this case brought them back to mind. Did a patch of seawater go missing somewhere? Or was all that horse flesh just created? I've been asking each of you why you joined the cavalry, but in your case, I think I can guess. Wardley grinned, teeth gleaming in the jungle of black beard, and spread his arms. Lieutenant Sanders moved back a pace. It saved my life, sir, he answered. Cystic fibrosis might not have had a year left. Your arrow fixed all that. Now I can breathe. He inhaled, man chest, then horse chest, pulling a cubic meter of air out of the room, then returning it. Fletcher thought of all the years Wardley had spent learning to breathe as deeply as he could. My family ran through the baseline treatments years ago, and we've been looking for an effective magic for a long time. Finally, a couple of really good seers said transformation would work for me. Why this transformation? Fletcher asked. Wardley raised shaggy brows in a why-would-you-ask expression that heartened Fletcher. Merman is a big environmental barrier, sir, and Sphinx, I wanted to keep my hands. Satyr, dismissive wave, to turn satyr was almost to sign up as a ne'er-do-well. There were other transformations, Lamassu, Scorpion Man, but they were still more freakish for this realm, and where would you even find someone to cast the spell? This way I get my health, keep my hands, can visit home, and even draw a salary and get an education, all in exchange for a body that wasn't working anyway. Of course, we might also ship you out to explore unknown dimensions where absolutely anything might happen to you, but there it is. I can't tell you how grateful I am, sir. I'll serve my 14 years gladly and maybe more. It's a gift just to have all that time to look forward to. I didn't have any plans before, sir, no point. The giant was burbling like a happy schoolboy, though not about schoolboy things. Fletcher sent up a silent prayer that the big pip got to enjoy all that newfound time. He nodded. Lots of men come into the cavalry like that. He glanced at Lieutenant Sanders, who took this for an invitation to join in. It was heart with me, he volunteered. Leaky valves. Now no leaky valves and two hearts, he grinned. Sir, that reminds me. I really have two hearts, Wardley asked. That's right. And the rest? I mean, how am I put together? I sort of rushed into... No, I don't mean that. I thought the decision over carefully, really. But quickly, Fletcher thought, and no wonder. But I wasn't thinking about the biology details then. But I am interested in medical things. Again, no wonder. Good. Maybe you'll become a cavalry vet. We'll go into all the details in the health classes. But just for a start, we're as close as possible to what the dictionary says we are. A man to the waist and a horse past the withers. 
two hearts, two stomachs, two livers, four lungs. The windpipe continues down into your barrel. Yes, I can feel it. Another meteorologically deep breath. If you got pleasure from just breathing, you were set for life, weren't you? Is that why my voice changed, sir? Everybody's did, but it was especially noticeable on Wardley's scale. That's right, two more lungs, even bigger than your first two. Lots of resonance. Wardley nodded and hummed softly to himself, experimentally, a pipe organ noise. What else gets duplicated? That's about all. Only the horse kidneys and bladder. The piping would be ridiculously long if the human set were included. No human intestine. That space is filled with muscles for the horse neck or the human trunk, whichever way you want to put it. I'm looking forward to those health classes, sir, Wardley said. Good. Speaking of matters medical, well, somewhat medical, what did you think of my talk this morning? Sounded sensible. It actually gave more leeway than I thought we'd get. I thought it would be more monastic. Fletcher tried to picture Wardley in monk's robes, but ran out of material. And even that would be acceptable to you? More acceptable than death. And it's reasonable. We obviously can't marry women. It may not seem as reasonable to you if you're chatting with one of those girls and suddenly notice how pretty and friendly she is. Well, then maybe I'll learn to flirt, sir. I never had the energy to spare before. I understand what you're saying, sir. All this live meat and blood and hormones, he stretched theatrically, nearly touching the ceiling while seated, is going to want to do what it's made for, and I'm not used to it. Less used to it than any of the other guys, I suppose. All I can say is that I'll try to remember that I thought your rules sensible. Meantime, I don't borrow trouble. I learned that lesson. But don't any women take the sagittum? No, the transformation doesn't work on them. In a few cases, an entire horse springs from their blood, but they find they can't bear to be separated from it, nor it from them. They must spend their lives together and die together. Why would it work like that? Fletcher shrugged. No one knows. Dr. Blackhold once proposed that it's because it's in the nature of females to bring forth complete new lives, not in the nature of males. But he was guessing. The long and short of it is there just aren't any women of this shape. How about mares? Well, not Mary, of course, but anatomically, it was not a new question. We're not supposed to. You're a man as well as a horse, and a man isn't supposed to. Ward Wardley nodded calmly. It was a theoretical question. It's not like I want to. Since Wardley seemed to like clinical directness, Fletcher answered, wait until you smell a mare in heat. Then you'll realize you're a stallion as well as a man. So brace yourself. That's to be the subject of the next heart-to-heart -heart from old Captain Fletcher at a morning inspection, but you got to it first. They often did. Wardley nodded gravely again. I understand, sir. As I said, he was interrupted by a gurgling growl from his equine belly. Sorry, sir, he said through a laugh. Are you hungry? I'm always a little hungry. Hmm. Come out here. Wardley squeezed after Fletcher into the outer office, where a large crockpot stood beside the coffee machine, exuding a smell like fresh-cut grass. Fletcher lifted the cover and ladled something dark green into a large bowl. You shouldn't always be hungry. Eat up. He handed the bowl and a spoon to Wardley. Wardley looked at it with distaste. So far, mulch is the only part of this I don't like. Nobody likes mulch. But your equine digestion needs it, and if you're hungry all the time, you're not getting enough. You eat plenty of human food, don't you? More than seems reasonable. I asked Dr. Blackholt about portions. Good. You should have said you were hungry. But it was just a little bit. Before, I was ravenous all the time. It was part of my CF. And he had still been so skinny before erupting into this. Every Sagitta carried the same spell, but took guidance from its target. Mostly, it followed the nature of the man. Wardley had been tall for what he had been, so he was tall for what he was now. He had black hair, so he now also had a black coat. And so on. Usually, this principle meant that any grave illnesses were blindly copied, too. But occasionally not. Sanders and Wardley were both very lucky and knew it. Maybe Wardley's bulk just reflected what he would have been without the CF.
But after seeing scores of transformations, Fletcher was sure a component of wish got in. Wardley had been deeply tired of being skinny and frail, and ta-da! You'll form new habits, and they'll have to include mulch. Wardley took a large spoonful and chewed without enthusiasm. Try not to chew, Fletcher advised. Just gulp it down. Wardley obeyed. Just chopped and boiled grass, right? He asked. That's right, pasturage. Only we don't have horse teeth, so we chop and boil it. Wardley swallowed again. I see what you mean. If you just gulp it, you taste it less. Can you do the same thing with hay? Yes, but it doesn't taste any better and is less nutritious. These help. He pulled salt and pepper shakers to the front of the table and a shaker labeled mixed herbs. Everyone makes up the recipe that works for them. I just bolt the stuff and get it over with. There's oats, volunteered Sanders. Take as much oatmeal as you like. The captain and I are office workers, so we shouldn't have too much, makes you antsy. But you pips are exercising all day, so you can take it whenever it's on offer. Wardley thanked them, obediently ate all their mulch, and left. That chap's all grown up already, Sanders observed, and grown and grown. But I know what you mean. He's come through a lot of hard choices and lessons, like you. Sanders hoisted his enormous mustaches in a smile. Happy endings, though. They started a new pot of mulch. Weldon paced in somberly, saluted, and took his seat on the pad when directed. He was a buckskin, with black hair, beard, socks, and tail, and a tan coat. He seemed quite ordinary, except for the gloomy tension he radiated. Physical evidence suggested nothing worse than nervous shyness, but alarms went off in Fletcher's head. At ease, Weldon, he said, which made no sense to someone already sitting, unless you saw how Weldon was sitting, his spines forming a Euclidean right angle. You're not here for a reprimand, you know. I'm talking with everybody. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. The spines flexed, slight the spines flexed slightly by deliberate effort. Then silence, eyes front, hands resting on lower shoulders. Well, after all, it wasn't up to Weldon to begin. Tell me, Weldon, how did you come to enlist? Pause. Then, I want to have new experiences and see the out zones. Enough to transform in order to do it? Yes, sir, a and do the 14 years service, as far away as you want to send me. Do you know when yet, sir? No. There will be the six months of introductory training, then we'll go out with the first expedition to a suitable realm as trainees. But the timing of the outgoing expedition depends on when other expeditions return, with information and personnel. We might go out immediately or have to wait another few months. We'd spend such time in more training. I see, sir. Silence again. But he had thought a little. Hands moved on the equine shoulders, and he met Fletcher's eyes. Fletcher turned again. Fletcher's turn again. He waited just a little. Could he torture a twitch of spontaneity out of this fellow? When he had shot this batch of recruits, slaying them out of the species of their birth, most had fallen down, changed under the kneading magic, then staggered to their new feet and tried themselves out. They stood, or tried to, Bryce had fallen down several times, but had appeared to enjoy it, laughing, picking up leg after leg, stumbling, patting themselves down, swishing their tails, looking back along their new bodies to observe the effect. Weldon had risen slowly in careful stages, then stood motionless, arms held out to his sides. He would breathed slow, deep breaths and stared blankly before him. Blackhold had sauntered toward him just in case of catatonia or a burst of hysteria, but Weldon had waved him back. Then he touched the red spot on his chest that marked the Sagitta strike and glanced down at the Sagitta itself, lying spent at his forefeet. Only then did he start a slow, careful inventory. It was not a rare reaction, but Fletcher noted how it chimed with his attitude now and he had certainly been the quietest recruit these past two months. Well, someone had to be quietest if you made a ranking of it, though Fells and Darnley were hardly rowdy, and there was big, steady Wardley. No Broncos this time around. 
Weldon was not required to be spontaneous. Stop being mean, Fletcher. Did you have any questions about my little lecture this morning? About how to handle your bachelorhood? No, sir. Very clear. Good. Something told Fletcher to be a little mean again. He waited. What are the migrations, sir? Bingo. Migrations? You said being a bachelor was a disadvantage, but there were migrations or something like that. I thought that meant there were trips we could take to help, but I didn't see how. Oh, mitigations means ways to make the situation not so bad. So you were close, but trips don't come into it. Fletcher did not aim to confuse. He hadn't thought the word so exotic, or maybe Weldon had heard what he wanted to. My brother's getting a good education too, sir, like you have in the cavalry. Right, this was the other fellow with a brother. What a contrast to Bryce. Yes, that's another cavalry tradition, scholars on hooves. In the old stories, the best one of us was a teacher. Yes, sir, I read about him when I was a kid. It's a sad story, though. Most myths are sad, but in the stories, there's nothing against Chiron. He was a great teacher and died in an accident, never malicious, honored by the gods, or what that's worth, considering the gods in question. You um, seem to be looking forward to travel a good deal. Migrations. Yes, sir, very much, sir. He sounded almost animated now. My father's a trader, and he took us abroad a lot. I've been to Mond Minor, New York, and Bilbao, and Amsterdam, and Parisi de Sousse, and Michelmont. Once we went to Yasad Kansu and played, stayed in the marches. It was amazing, definitely animated now. Well, he wouldn't be going anywhere in the Mond Minor soon. My brother showed us pictures he took in the Ithil Reach. Genuine out zone, no denying that, not like Yasad Kansu, which was merely altar zone. Fletcher thought Weldon might already have quite a good education. I would love to explore some place no one human, um, Fletcher smiled. We still count for these purposes, and you'll have human troops with you. But tripping over the word human had reminded Weldon of something. It's too bad about the migrations, though. It was. And now the little spring thaw was done, and he was freezing over again. But for better ways of being a bachelor, I was thinking, pause. I noticed in the stables we have mares and geldings, but no stallions. That's right, we're the only stallions here. And, if you, and you live in barracks, not stables, even if they're divided into stalls, to make it clear you're still people. Having stallions in the stables would be an unnecessary complication, though he had been going to say, though you'll eventually learn to work with stallion war horses, but Weldon actually cut him off in his hurry to get out his next utterance. I was wondering, sir, to make it easier to be a bachelor, since it works so well with the mares and geldings, I mean, the geldings are no trouble, so I wondered if it wouldn't be simplest if Dr. Blackhole just... He trailed off in the face of Fletcher's expression. Popeye'd shock was not an expression Fletcher used much, but he had not forgotten how. In the, office, in the outer office, Sanders knocked over a can of pencils, then did not curse, but stayed intently silent. Fletcher's receptants, already working overtime on Weldon, kicked in again. You didn't take the sagita because a girl threw you over, did you? You did. No, sir, by St. Martin, you did. Weldon blushed furiously behind the new beard and looked miserable. Well, be that as it may, no, you may not get yourself gelded. Quite apart from the monstrosity of the idea, and we're monstrous enough as it is, the point of putting you on hooves is to make you strong and brave for the service of the realm, so you are not going to undo any of that. I don't know what you wanted out of your transformation, but we want a strong man welded to a war horse. Weldon's eyes glanced from Fletcher down to his human torso, now certainly more heavily muscled than before. He was actually listening. In response, Fletcher assumed a less hectoring, more lecturing manner. A stallion's worth of testosterone doesn't just work on your new legs and horseback. It's in your arms and shoulder and man back, too. We have intelligent men and women. We have strong horses and machines. But it's a real edge to have the intelligence and strength in one body. 
you are not to deprive us of that edge by... I wish I could show you a horse stallion next to a gelding. You'd see the difference. A lot bigger, Weldon asked quietly. Heavier neck and shoulders, but mainly more fiery. And being fiery makes us brave, he muttered, a touch bitterly. Does that mean more fiery? Sorry, I spoke in heat. Quick smile. After all, I too am a stallion. Fletcher thought his language had been quite parliamentary, considering what Weldon had suggested, but he was trying to sell Weldon on being a stallion. Fletcher continued in lecture mode while he waited for more clues. No one can make you braver, but any emergency room or prison shows you that men are more rash than women. Being a stallion cranks that way up. It's up to you to turn rash into daring, or tragedy ensues. Testosterone's supposed to make it easier for a man to take risks, to be daring, and even more so for us. Supposed to be. And if it isn't, we make it so. He unfolded his legs and leaned over the desk. But courage isn't just about taking the risk. It's also about enduring when it's tough. Any kind of tough. Enduring a trek through partial vacuum and twisty gravity in the out zones, or enduring the consequences of your mistake, or enduring a broken heart. That's not about testosterone or being male. That's just being a, a mensch, a worthwhile person. There's even courage in living with a frustrated sex drive rather than... Did you think the company of women would be so very hard to put up with? I don't think it will come up anymore. Almost whispered from a face gone from crimson to white. Are you running off to the out zones or away to the out zones? because one is willing to endure and the other is not, even if they take you to the same place. He didn't cringe. Weldon stared back at him, white-faced, but he did not cower. He actually listened and nodded a little and husked, I understand, sir. No, I really love the idea of exploration and I want to be of some use. Use, yes. Being useful could be a great way to punish yourself if you took hard service, leave home, bind yourself to 14 years, forswear marriage, which had forsworn you, and abandon your very shape. Yes, that would work very well. You could go on to become masculine in pronoun only and then see what else you could inflict. Fletcher sat back down with a thump. He hated being angry. I apologize, Weldon, for the lecture. But don't repeat that suggestion to Dr. Blackholt if you don't want a worse reaction. I won't repeat it at all, sir. Good. Fletcher tried to tally how bad the situation now was. Apparently Weldon was doing the same. Was it a mistake for me to take the Sagitta, he asked. Is that what you meant by living with the consequences? It had been at that moment, but what did Fletcher really know? He believed his receptance about the girl more than ever, but maybe she had been the one love of his life. Maybe that's how his heart was built, and now there was no point in staying hum human. Maybe he really did have a passion to explore, and that's what was now left to him. In short, maybe he had not made a mistake. But he still ought to keep his... This time, Weldon waited him out. Fletcher suppressed the urge to say, well, it's too late now. Whoever invented the Sagittae, they wanted the transformations to stick. Subsequent transformations broke or wore off easily. It took beings more powerful than humans, fays, or jinn to make changes stick, and such creatures were rare and dangerous. Even seemings were hard if they aimed to disguise you as human. Horse seemings were easy. At length, he answered, it's too soon to tell. Go out there and show us how indispensable you can be on a scouting expedition. Discover something. Rescue someone. Be a great scholar on hooves. Be a terrific uncle. Be a mesh, mensch. Yes, it's Yiddish. It means a worthwhile person. I learned it from a golem. I thought he was a mensch. Be a mensch, and the Sagitta wasn't a mistake. It all depends on what you do with it. Thank you, sir. Fletcher cast about for something calming and positive to say, some way to lower the conversational temperature. 
Then Weldon did it for him by asking, is it true, sir, that Dr. Blackholt gets the Sagittas from up the road to the sun? He makes them, and, then, and he has been up the road to the sun at least twice for some distance, but I don't know if that's where he got anything related to the Sagittae. Their nature is a trade secret, a family secret, protected by a royal patent. His great uncle was the one who analyzed the spell. It's copied from one used on us in a surprise attack back during World War II. Before that, we didn't know that this, he spread his arms indicating his body and Weldon's equally, was a transformation. We thought it was the form of a rare kind of fay from Greece. Have you been up the road to the sun, sir? The eager note was back in the voice. Away, as far as Meru and Patala, we saw Nagas, Rakshasa, Gandharvas, Asparas. For a few minutes, he let himself be a reminiscing oldster enchanting a youngster. He was quite sure now that whatever catastrophe on the romantic side haunted Weldon, he really did yearn for far places. And then, as it did a handful of times a year, Fletcher's receptance blossomed into a moment of sight. He was standing in front of Weldon, who was now older. They were both in some kind of heavy gear. Behind Weldon was a cavalry troop, a scouting expedition of many species of beasts and people, all geared like them. A rocky, warping landscape that was almost a web of stone faded away behind them into a perpetual sandstorm. Fletcher was handing Weldon a passage map that they both knew to be two-thirds guesswork. Weldon was smiling proudly. And this was the last time Fletcher would ever see him. Would he go to his death or just out of Fletcher's ken? Would they never meet, but Fletcher would hear of Weldon's exploits years later? The sight was just a glimpse. Sir, was there anything else? Fletcher realized he was giving Weldon an X-ray stare. No, Weldon, that's all. When Weldon had left, a trifle tottery, Sanders poked his head in and said, I don't know why we bother to keep a chaplain. What was I supposed to say when he proposed castration? I think you did fine. He sure caught me on the off foot. If he were another sort of man or lived in the Mond Minor, he'd have just run away to sea to be a sailor, only he's done something more drastic than get an anchor tattooed on his shoulder. Are you having that vision thing again, sir? Shut up or I'll read your tea leaves. Carlin entered panting, flipped an adequate salute, and stood in the doorway. He was a paint with patches of ruddy brown on a white ground. He was smiling, but there was always a quarter smirk to his expression that brought to mind the phrase, take that look off your face. However, a crooked smile is not insubordination, and Fletcher reminded himself to play fair. He returned a smile that felt slightly brittle and said, have a seat, Carlin, have a good gallop. Yes, sir, that's a fair treat. Best thing so far about this new shape. How about that, an innocent statement? Were you a runner before? Nah, not particularly. Am now. He puffed in his new 4-4 rhythm for a few seconds, then evened out. Quick recovery. Perhaps you'd like to be a courier. That's the only way to have reliable communications with the out zones. Yeah, that might be a go. Actual enthusiasm. Perhaps he'd misjudged the beast. Around now in the training schedule, when people are over the shock and starting to settle in, I try to get to know each of you more individually. For a start, what prompted you to join? That smile and a shrug. It looked like fun, he said, as one stating the obvious. Well, yes, I agree, but it is a serious step. Permanent transformation, 14 years service, and your pants no longer fit. Why was he stating the obvious? Is he got the feeling Carlin hadn't taken in the situation? That's okay, Carlin answered. Anyway, transformations and things happen in the out zones too, don't they? Yes, but they're not the kind of thing you can count on or want to encounter. Have you heard of the Eidman expedition? It was eight years ago, two passages out from Gavura in some march that was nothing but a hazy index number. They met something we later called the Maelstrom of Freet. It was never really classified, though. 
lit into the expedition with all manner of nastiness, including shape-casting. Eleven people did get back, but they had quite a chore proving who, or even what, they had originally been. Our fey mages did their best and got Jinnish help, but there was no trace of the old forms to return to. In the end, the survivors' appearances had to be reconstructed from old photos and medical records. Carlin listened with interest, but no straight trace of apprehension. You don't want to encounter shapecasters in the outzones, Fletcher insisted, and most of them aren't even as survivable as the maelstrom of Freet. They're more in the pillar of salt line. I hope and expect to live out my life in this form. The smile remained. That's fine, too. Well, good. Fine. I have to say, though, you almost sound like you don't care what shape you are. Oh, no, it has to be a good one, like this. Carlin reached back and slapped himself on the flank. Fletcher made one more try. You aren't under the impression that this wears off when the 14 years are up, are you? I've known one or two very muddled fellows who thought that, and of course they're still nailing their shoes on in fours. The smile finally vanished, replaced by irritation. I get it. Four legs and a tail, a lot of horse meat, and it's this way until further notice. There's always seemings. Fletcher gave a slow half nod. You should know it's hard to make us seem human. Who said I wanted to seem human? Fletcher ignored the insubordinate attitude as he had been ignoring the lack of sirs. Carlin wasn't usually quite so flip, and there would be time for correction later. Fletcher wanted to explore the fellow's attitude. So Carlin looked forward to a life in a large, strange form, alleviated with a series of magical disguises, disguises that took him still further from his original appearance. This, unfortunately, fit well with what Fletcher knew about Carlin. He had not taken against the fellow because of his smirk that had just iced the cake. Rather, the scanty documentation he got on the new pips indicated that Carlin had been released without conviction on a smuggling charge within the past year. Carlin would be very far from the first man to seek a fresh start in the dedicated cavalry, but Fletcher had always thought it prudent to make inquiries about such recruits. Fellows who had made one big mistake or a string of little ones along the lines of drunken brawling often turned out fine. Nothing like having your nervous system rewired for breaking bad habits, apparently, and Fletcher would definitely teach you self-discipline. But Carlin's record ran to smuggling and theft, some minor and paid for, others medium to major and never proved. Crimes of deliberation. Fletcher wondered if it was the wish-granting aspect of the Sagitta that was responsible for Carlin's sudden new bent for running. The penny dropped. Carlin was on the run. He was a smuggler thief from London with pretensions to being big time, and something had gone very wrong. So he had done a serious skip. As with Wardley, for him it was transform or die. That's why he was so blasé about the change. Any serviceable form would do. At least transformation was the evasion he had chosen, and it was probably a good one. His pursuers might never think to look up the obscure public records of who had enlisted this year in the dedicated cavalry. Carlin was probably his real name. Or by the time they thought to, he would have trooped off the zone under, as it were, military escort. He would visit the furthest known reaches of existence, gaining experience. Then, 14 years from now, or likely very much sooner, he would light out into the gallimaufry of world fragments and be gone. This, of course, was hunch, though Fletcher did not doubt it. He reminded himself that, even given the hunch, he did not know whether Carlin or his unknown enemies were more in the right. Carlin could be the comparatively innocent victim. All Fletcher could do was be just to Carlin while he was here, and protect his other charges from Carlin and his troubles, if need be. For instance, if Carlin looked like corrupting Bryce, Fletcher would cheerfully stuff a sofa with him. Carlin, meanwhile, was still annoyed. I could deal with the shape just fine. The 14 years is the hard part, if you want to know. The smirk came back. Is there any kind of early discharge possible in return for extraordinary services? You mean time off for good behavior? You're not in prison, Carlin. You volunteered. Carlin's smirk was gone again. 
He traded brief, cold glances with Fletcher. There's medical discharge, of course, if you're incapacitated. Fletcher decided to go fishing. And one does hear rumors of fellows taken out of regular service for special expeditions. The smirk ba was back, maybe even something of a genuine smile. Fellows sent out singly or in small teams, all on their own, in zones with strange, little-known cultures, spying. Dangerous, of course. They often never come back. Carlin was grinning now. These prospects clearly suited him to the tip of his newly acquired tail. But these opportunities don't come along right away, if they exist. First, there's the trainee run, then heaven knows where. That's fine. I like seeing new things. Distant ones. Well then, about this morning's talk on bachelorhood. I'd like some clarification. I figured bachelor was a bit of a, what do they call, euphemism, am I right? Not really. You are in law, not allowed to marry now. Well, marriage was never on my list anyway. To spell out the part not implied by the word bachelor, you are bound by your oath, which has the force of law, not to couple with any woman. It won't work, and you'll hurt her if you try. That seems a little unimaginative. No coupling. Other than that, you are only under the same constraints as any other man in the realm. Imagination is quite legal. But for your own safety, if not for that of your fellow stallions, avoid giving even the appearance of forcing yourself on any woman. Again the smirk. Not my style anyway, never had to. So, to sum up, no coupling with a woman. Other than that, she and I are as free as before. And no coupling with a woman. That's what I can't couple with. Am I right? Fletcher dryly acknowledged this standard loophole. Should you, for example, meet an adventurous giantess or shapeshifter in the out zones, nothing in your oath would prevent the two of you from comporting yourselves in any way you chose. He did not mention morality or local marriage laws, and neither did Carlin. Yeah, that's an example. Okay, good enough. You don't have to worry about me and the girls. We'll manage. Are we done, sir? Yes, go do pure deeds. Carlin smiled at the sarcasm, rose and saluted without visible insolence, and left. That one will be at the mayor's soon, said Sanders. He as good as said so. Then if he's caught, we will see to it that he learns to say he is sorry in a very sincere manner. Given the predictability of this problem, sir, it's occurred to me to wonder why we have mayors in the stables at all. Why not just geldings? Better mayors than village girls. I see, sir. The mares do smell lovely when it's their time, sir. Fletcher nodded and put Carlin's folder in the outbasket. Hard for a chap to say no. Who's next? Darnley was next and last. He was a big bay, rather heavily built, though not in Wardley's weight class. He was always sober, but more so now, though he did not radiate Weldon's intense unease. He saluted and sat, then said, I'm sorry about the shaving, sir. I didn't realize it was uh, an issue. Mentally, Fletcher got up, turned around, and kicked himself in the back of the head with both rear hooves. It had been an extraordinarily bad idea to bring the subject up at all, especially in front of the others. And if this is his receptance telling him so now, why couldn't it have done so beforehand? Uh, not at all, Darnley. Shouldn't have made personal remarks. Not an issue at all. He decided to pay for the gaffe with some disclosure. Personal grooming was on my mind because sometimes when a fellow takes special care with his appearance, it's because of a girl. It, given the subject of bachelorhood, I couldn't help wondering, uh, but I know now that neither you nor Fells, he brought himself up short. He had no right to talk about Fells to Darnley. And how did he know if Darnley did or didn't? Only he did know, now. Maybe. He was no Delphic oracle. No, sir, it's nothing like that. Ah, good. Here is an awkward pause, thought Fletcher, and it's your own fault. I wanted to know how you came to decide to enlist. Darnley seemed to suffer his own awkward pause, though shorter than Fletcher's, then said, I wanted to better myself, sir. But the bland remark had cost him effort. Fletcher blinked. Well, that's uncommonly generous of you, Darnley. 
there are still plenty of people who consider the transformation degrading. Darnley nodded. Less than a man. Mm. Rot, of course. Uh, better yourself how? I wanted to pursue my academic interests. Fletcher nodded. He thought Darnley was now shying away from his difficult subject, but he wasn't lying. The other recruits in this batch had just written short, stilted letters of application. At most, Carlin had just sent in the application form. Darnley had sent in a resume. He had a bachelor's degree from a Montminer College where he had studied physical science with a minor in philosophy and two letters of recommendation from royal advisors attesting to his knowledge of and interest in metaphysical geography. He had also applied for membership in the Curdians, and though he had been refused, the rejection letter invited him to reapply once he discovered something. His cover letter explained that he wanted to work on the problem of the origin of the out zones, the multitude of realms and domains and dimensionettes that linked to the world. Already a scholar on hooves. But why the hooves? The expeditionary forces will be happy to give you full scope on that. But why did you pick the dedicated cavalry rather than, say, the standard cavalry or the infantry? We all go on the expeditions together. And now he was screwing himself up to the difficulty. The central virtue of a scientist was honesty. The central virtue of a soldier was courage. Darnley wants to be both. Let's see how he does. I have a question, Darnley said. Yes. Am I a man? Fletcher examined the question for a moment, not Am I still a man, as he was often asked by those who found the changes more upsetting than they expected? Fletcher sidled up to the question. Do you know what liminal means? It means on the edge or on the border. Right. When you stood up to take the Sagitta, you volunteered for a liminal life, a life on the border. It means questions like, am I a man, often have long answers. Physically, no, clearly not. You're half of a man and most of a stallion. He had picked man and stallion over human and horse deliberately and watched Darnley's reaction. He had a suspicion. Spiritually, you're still a son of Adam with all the baggage that comes with that. Fletcher knew there had been arguments about this, maybe still were in some circles, but he knew what he thought on the subject and he wasn't going to muddle Darnley about it now. In between those two poles, the answer is usually that you are a man and you are a stallion and you are both at once, not by turns, not in patches. The both at once part is the trickiest because there's no training for it, except places like here in Saint Eloy. Does that answer your question? And to get back to my question, why did you choose us? I chose the cavalry, Darnley said slowly, instead of the others, because I was dissatisfied with my own personality. I wanted to change, to change me, and not just my shape. I know there's more to this than just the shape. Change in what way? Fletcher asked as mildly as he could. In a murmur, I never felt I was very good at being male. Ah, one of those. And that explained the shaving. If you thought your manhood, okay, now read masculinity, was defective, you didn't want to draw attention to it by doing anything so overtly male as growing a beard. And then good old Cap'n Fletcher drew everybody's attention to the issue this morning. He mentally wheeled and kicked himself a few more times. He must have been in receipt about this already at inspection, only with nowhere near enough clarity. He reflected it would be interesting to make Weldon and Darnley share a stall, the one feeling all unworthy of masculinity, the other feeling all unworthy for lack of it. You're 23, the file says, young enough to think your problem very rare and strange and contemptible. What mockers passed judgment on you and made it stick? Doesn't matter now. If one was insecure about one's masculinity, there were obvious attractions to this transformation. Yet here he was, 
imbruted, incarnate, installed in a stallion, as the poet said, and still asking, worried the magic hadn't worked. But authority has its own magic. Fletcher couldn't instantly undo whatever wounds had been struck by whatever tormentors lay in Darnley's past, but he could make a beginning. I'm your captain and teacher, not your therapist, Fletcher began. In the outer office, Sanders snorted and turned it into a cough. But I'll help if I can. Did you choose us, hoping the transformation would make you more masculine? He nodded. Are you afraid it hasn't? Another nod. Why? Well, I've been watching myself, I bet you have, and the other fellows for signs of, of horsiness in behavior. And have you seen any? Would it bother you if you did? No, sir, it wouldn't. I'd like, he'd like to find he was getting horsey. But I don't know. I can't tell about the other guys, but I feel different now, shook up, edgy, full of hunches. And the classes in horse care, I never knew a lot about horses before, but it seems uh, suspiciously easy to understand. That's as it should be. Besides changing your shape, the Sagitta gave you intuitive knowledge of equine body language and what it's like to be a horse generally. It's a lot easier to spot a rock in your hoof if you had one yourself. Just wait till the first time you have colic, that'll teach you sympathy. There are horse vets who've taken the Sagitta just for that. But this business about horse knowledge isn't what worries you, it's just evidence you've changed. Are you worried about feeling edgy? Yes, sir, I'm worried I might even that I might be more fearful than you were before. You come looking to become more masculine and think you may have become more cowardly. But Fletcher knew the answer to that problem. That edginess is extra energy because you're young and healthy as both human and horse, and horses are meant to run. Enjoy it. Oh, you might feel jumpier. You've got adrenal glands the size of cantaloupes now. Not literally true. But you're not a coward, which was what he needed to hear. The Sagitta creates the stallion in you following the nature of the man. And only a brave man stands in front of me and lets me shoot him in the chest. Again, what he needed to hear. But Fletcher's encouragement was not pure propaganda. There had been certain cases of men who ran or ducked at the last moment. If they were struck a glancing blow that pierced the skin, they sometimes changed anyway. It was not a good way to start. Darnley had been the last in line as Fletcher had paced solemnly past six naked young men and shot them in the chest one by one from three yards away. Darnley had seen all the others yelp or groan, then melt, churn, and start to ferment, but he had stood his ground. None of them were cowards. Darnley's courage might have been taught by desperation, but it had been learned. So don't worry if you feel strange and wobbly. If you didn't, I'd, I'd be worried, considering the trauma you've been through. Trauma? You've had half your body swept away and replaced with something inhuman, had new nerves crawl into your brain and blossom into new motor centers. You're still relearning to walk and eat. Of course that's trauma. If you took it casually, he thought of Carlin, I'd be worried. You have one of those self-winding minds that worries about how much it worries and is upset over being upset. I recognize a kindred spirit. But don't worry about feeling weird here and now. A smile. It's normal to feel weird now? Oh my, yes. I've seen scores of transformations, good and bad, almost all good, and yours went fine. In a jocular tone, he added, whatever you were before, now you're a big strapping man stallion. Fletcher knew perfectly well what Darnley had been before. A slightly tall, slightly bulky young man, but let's imply clean slates, new beginnings, and use macho words. Yes, my lad, you are in fact a real boy, and I officially certify you genuine. The blue fairy can save herself the trip. Fletcher wondered if he was laying it on too thick. Darnley was blushing, eyes cast down, but he was also wearing a big goofy grin, so probably not. He gazed at the huge creature in front of his desk and wondered how such a one could feel unsure of being properly male. One pep talk from the old guy in loco parentis was a start, but only a start. What did it take? 
The answer, if there was one, was not a matter of words, but of finding some male friends, all comfortable with their maleness, all assuming he was just as simply, routinely, obviously male as they, just so they were friends, mates, buddies. He might feel like an imposter among them, but that could wear off. He needn't have taken the Sajja to get, to get such an answer. The friends could just as well have been human as any number of other things. The musing slipped into another flash of sight. Darnley, an older Darnley with a graying beard, reared on his hind legs against something like a radio mast, one foreleg braced against the mast, working on an instrument pack at the tip. He wore a khaki jacket, a lot of harness, and a visor that looked like glasses but was probably something high-techy. A dwarf sat on Darnley's back, one leg hooked into the harness, fussing with wires in the mast. A badger and a raccoon worked under him at the base of the mast while two men in uniforms, one on horseback, one afoot, watched. They all stood on a bit of rocky hill, and over them hung a sky swirling with colors like oil on water. And Darnley smiled an easy, contented smile. Well, okay. That made up for the ambiguous one with Weldon. Fletcher realized, though, that he was giving Darnley a similar X-ray stare. Darnley stared back curiously. Are you all right, sir? To be sure, Fletcher answered, realizing that he himself was smiling. Just one of his little spells, called Sander from the outer office. Fletcher snorted. I was merely preoccupied with a train of thought. Sorry. Uh, I hope you're less worried, Darnley. Just take that new energy and use it for the forward charge. Advice he would never give to some pips, but there was no dar danger of Darnley ever slackening the reins on himself. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Fletcher realized they were now, finally, at the point in the conversation where he meant to ask Darnley about how he meant to cope with bachelorhood. He decided to skip it. They were both wrung out. And when Darnley reached the point where an oath of bachelorhood was cramping his style, it would be a day of victory. He would have a style to cramp. Dismiss, Darnley. You'll be fine. Thank you, sir. So are you secure in your masculinity, Sanders? Fletcher's asked when they were alone. Mom told me I was a boy. Dr. Blackholt concurs. I'm sure Darnley wishes it were that simple for him. May I offer an opinion, sir? please. Maybe Darnley should be told that being uneasy about his male identity or whatnot is just a cross he has to bear, like leaky heart valves or cystic fibrosis, and a cross that's a good deal lighter than those. That's wise enough, Lieutenant, but he may know that already. He seems to be getting on with things. I haven't seen him slacking or whining. He's not as withdrawn as Fells, and you and Wardley dropped your crosses when you could. Fair enough, Sanders admitted, but if he's told we all have defects, this one just happens to be his, he might not feel so specially inferior. Make it easier for him. I think the jump he has to get over is to realize that his problem is a feeling of special inferiority, not actual inferiority. Like realizing that your problem is hallucinations, not real crabs the size of tables. Does this relate to that story of yours about going drinking with the merman on Victory Day? It does indeed. Fletcher closed Darnley's file, put all the files away, and stepped into the outer office. There he stretched, whisked his tail, shivered the skin on his flanks, an action that still startled the pips whenever they did it by accident, and wished he had a mane to shake. It clearly gave horses great satisfaction. Too much desk time. Never take a lot of psychology classes if you're receptant, he told Sanders. They interact disastrously. Fortunately, sir, I'm as mundane as they come, said the mythical beast. I meant besides that. I still don't believe you. I think I have time for a couple of laps around the track before horse care class, and I need them. May I join you, sir? Please. Sanders put his own paperwork away, locked the computer, and stood. Let's see, we've got two come for lost love, one come for his health, one following his big brother, a crook on the run, and one trying to find himself. A bloody equine foreign legion, about usual. Not such fools as the ones who come on a dare or a bet, or for a thrill, 
No one went into a screaming funk when they transformed, and all but Carlin are willing to work their 14 years. Carlin will probably bolt at the first opportunity, and I shall smile and wave bye-bye. Waste of a Sagitta. Until then, mustn't be unfair to just because I don't like him. The rest are straight-souled, I think. I shall have to work not to show favoritism to Bryce or Wardley. As to their souls, sir, and as I remarked, we do have a chaplain who is a splendid fellow but who has never been transformed and is not going to spend months with us out on an expedition to the out zones. Sanders, normal men don't enlist in this cavalry. They either have strange backgrounds like Bryce and me or severe problems like the rest of you. Sometimes the problems are straightforward like yours and Wardley's, other times they're twisty. These six are all I have to work with for a year or more. I have to know them and to make the best of them. Make the best of them. That's a rather ambiguous phrase, sir. Well, what are creatures like us if not ambiguous? Fletcher headed for the track. Walk, trot, canter, gallop. And we'll hear more about the cavalry next time.